Oh yes, and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV with myself, Jared Brown, and joined by, of course, our regular, our very own Gary Spain, and former Republic of Ireland player and manager Owen Hand to look back on the first of our new series of different Ireland managers' reigns. Yes, as you will have seen over on social media over the last few days, that we are going to look back over different Ireland managers' reigns over the next coming weeks, starting right back from when Gary was our first going to games back in the 1970s, right up to the modern day and the current day. And we're going to start right back in the, in the beginning to before 1986 and Jack Charles and in some people's eyes when football started in this country and look back on John Giles and Owen Hans reign. And as of course, as you've seen there, we are delighted to be joined by the man himself, Owen. Owen, you're very welcome to the channel. It's a great pleasure to have you on, a player and a manager of this country. Yeah, it's nice to be on. Uh, interesting uh, topic, trying to, you know, going back to years and remembering. So it's, uh, oh yeah, so it's nice to be able to chat about it. As I touched on there, Gary, um, this is the wrong time that you will start first going to matches. Uh, the Switzerland game and qualifying for Euro 76 in May uh, 1975, which of course, some people were seeing uh, brief glimpses of that campaign the other night and was on RT with that 4 0 victory against Russia and Jelly Mount Park or the USSR as a water back then. Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, the first game I attended was Switzerland 75. I have memories going back before that, and I can remember uh, certainly uh, own as a player, and it, but it was mainly actually listening on the radio in those days, but uh, and from the early days of uh, John Giles' reign and uh, well, from there on, then really, Owen actually played in the first match I attended as a fan in that Switzerland game. Yeah, yeah that Switzerland game in uh, 75, the Lewis there, that was part of the qualifying phase for Euro 76. Uh, completely different to now, then not even the top teams were guaranteed to qualify automatically. They had to go through a playoff. As I mentioned there, Owen, you played in that game. There were some very, very good home results in that campaign, as we've seen. As I touched on, was on RT the other night with Don Gibbons got that hat trick against the USSR. He scored four goals home against Turkey. But, and as I mentioned, Gary was at the game where we bet Switzerland 2 1. But was that defeat in the first game away to Switzerland probably the result that cost us making the playoffs in the end for Euro 76? Yeah, that's right. That game was in Bern, as I recall. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was a huge blow to us. You know, like uh, we, we were we anticipating that we could get a draw out of it at least. Uh, but it wasn't to be, um, and it was very, very disappointing. Um, I can remember actually the great, the late great Luke Kelly was at that game. Um, <laughs> he gave us some sort of consolation afterwards because we were all really down. And uh, um, you know, John Giles obviously again was it got us all together, and uh, we had to just move on to the next game, which is what you always do, as they say in football. But it was very disappointing. Yeah, that was the campaign as well that Liam Brady made his debut that USSR game in Damon Park when we won 3 0. Like, you wouldn't think there was well, a debut the way he just oozed class that even could. Was the signs evident from training leading into that game that he just looked like he had a player that was ready to be a top, top star? Well, actually, the story beyond that is that uh, we had gone on a South American tour and I'd scored the previous game, which was a couple of months before that particular game against the Soviets, Soviet Union, that was. And Don got the three goals. Um, and I'd scored a winner against Chile out in Santiago uh, from a corner kick that John Giles took. So uh, when we were gathered, it's funny actually this, when we were gathered in uh, Blackrock College, it was, uh, getting ready for the, for the game against the Soviet, um, I actually made, made it. I, uh, we were talking about, John was talking about the tactics of it. Now, he doesn't recall it, but I do, and other players do. That I just said uh, after he, he had his general chat about our last game and all that kind of thing, and I said, "Well, when I go, I, you know, as I did, same position from the corner kick again. This game, there was a bit of a silence, and of course, oh, he, then he called me over. I mean, I thought he, he just said to me, "Well, a bit difficult because you're dropped. Uh, <laughs> I'm not playing." <laughs> and actually, then what happened was. Uh, he, Liam Brady was making his debut, so I was a defensive midfielder. But here was a game against uh, the Soviets, and uh, Liam was making his debut in my position. So I've got that claim to fame that I gave way to one of the greatest footballers that Ireland's ever had. Uh, as it happened, actually, Mancini 
Terry Mancini was the centre back, and he got sent off against the uh, Soviets that day, and I got back in, and I at centre back, and of course I kept my position then, so he never got back in. Well, not not that I can recall anyway. <laughs> so it's a strange, but I mean, yeah, that game talking about it was uh, obviously I was very disappointed not to be playing. It was a packed Daily Mount and uh, you know massive crowd and. Liam was as if as he he played a game as if he'd been playing international football all the time. Uh, you know, he really was. He was kind of a. It was amazing his debut he made there. You know, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, between himself and John Giles, now we certainly had some creativity in there. Giles was a tremendous passer of the ball, and uh, Liam great skills. Like I mean, that left foot of his was just amazing. Yeah, so uh, that was the, and of course Don Gibbons. I was talking to Don actually yesterday. I had a good chat with Don yesterday. He lives over near Birmingham, and we were just talking about that game. Um, I was watching it on the television the other night, and his three goals. And the funny thing about that, which we were talking about more than the game, was we had to be back at our respective clubs the next day. Him, QPR, and me, Portsmouth. Um, we had to be back for, I think it was a game on the Monday or whatever it was, two days. So we went straight from the dressing room, straight actually from the pitch to the dressing room, got our things there, no shower, tracksuit on, ran down the lane with the supporters, done with the ball under his hand, and then waiting on a bus, a fella, uh, we, we, we just, we didn't know how to, how we've got to get to the airport. So we, we dashed, we got this, this man actually couldn't believe, he says, well, you got the game, lads, when we got in. And then he, then, he, then he dropped. He says, "Hey, then you're Don Gibbons when you know, Don was there with the ball," and he couldn't believe it. Like you know, the two of us were there, and he dropped us to the airport. I can never remember his name, but he he was kind of amazed. Like I mean, that he'd been watching Don score these three goals just oh maybe fifteen minutes before that type of thing. You know, the game had all just finished. And he, anyway, that was we made it to our plane anyway, and we both got back to to our clubs in England. That's the way it was then. I mean, the the, 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 the kind of the scheduling was, was kind of ridiculous. Uh, always a kind of a conflict between club and country. Yeah, so that was that story. Actually, Owen, just you, you mentioned that now and you mentioned it was a bit hairy and things weren't as well organised back then. I, I think John Giles, you played under the likes of uh, Sean Thomas and all that before that. Uh, do you think... Uh, and Mick Megan, do, do you think John brought in a level of professionalism into the, the squad or, or certainly improved it from what it had been before or was it always uh, just as haphazard in those days? No, look, I mean, there was always problems with the, with the you know, the, shall we say the hierarchy, you know what I mean? It was all, yeah. it was all free trips and all that. I mean, and I mean, it was only—it wasn't too long before then that the actually the, the, the committee picked the team and the squad. I mean, you don't have to go back too far. And John Giles was one of the ones that uh, kind of rebelled against that. So the the actual man in charge was able to pick the squad and pick the team. But yeah. that's how ridiculous it was. So I mean, when John came and he got the job, he did certainly bring a a, a, a great level of professionalism to because. John was so respected in the football world, you know, and he, you know, he gave us all a confidence to say, okay, fine, look, come on, we're, we're going to be organized. We're, we all knew what was expected of us on the day. Um, now, he was still very busy with Leeds. So, I mean, he could never, he could never actually affect any of the, some, some of the, the scheduling and whatever, the, the arrangements that were made. Um, I mean, it was kind of some of the stuff that was ridiculous. I mean, the hotels we stayed in, the travel arrangements. John, I, I did deal with that. I mean, I did because I had the time when I became manager, but John didn't. But I mean, to answer your question, original question, yes, John brought, brought a huge level of professionalism to it that uh, the other managers previous that didn't have the opportunity to do it. And also, I mean, they wouldn't have played and they wouldn't have been playing at the same high level that John Giles was. So John had this immediate uh, kind of uh, charisma you know, or esteem like amongst us all. Uh, we'd all admired him as a player with Leeds and their successes. So yes, was the answer. I wonder if that taxi driver picked up many Ireland players straight after a game in Tillymount Park or Lansdowne after that. 
So the rest of John's campaigns, he overseen qualifying for the World Cup in 70 and Euro 80. And it was a case of good home results. We bet France in trying to qualify for the World Cup in 78. We bet Bulgaria and um, Denmark at home in qualifying for Euro 80. But our away form kind of really what was cost us in terms of really being in serious contention for making them finals. Yeah, I, and I look back and I kind of now look from a distance. I can say an awful lot of those away results were down to the arrangements. I mean, our travel arrangements were disgraceful. And our accommodation when we traveled abroad were shocking as well, you know, generally speaking. So, I mean, we, you can nearly say we were kind of a beaten force before we went out. Now, that's exaggerating it a bit. I mean, I, go, I just go back an example. I mean, when, when we played the Soviets or whatever they were called, USSR, in Moscow, under me, I I knew because I, I knew Sepp Piontek was the Denmark manager at the time, that the Danes brought their own chef and their own food and did all that. Well, I finished up to embarrass the FAI. I had to say they wouldn't give me a chef because I'd, I'd asked for a chef from the Burlington and the Burlington uh, the hotel there. And uh, uh, but anyway, it finished up that I said to my wife, if I can. Uh, persuade them to take you, would you come out and cook them, thinking that they wouldn't. And they said, oh, that'd be great. And I mean, you know, that kind of thing should never happen. Uh, that we went out to say to Moscow, say that for that game, at least we were going to be, you know, uh, fed properly. Because you you go to these places and the foods, lots of the lads would be getting wet, but certainly in Moscow, Moscow tummy, they called it, like, I mean, the flipping, whatever it was. I mean, there was everybody got sick when they went there. So we avoided that. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's, there was always a battle against sort of a, trying to get a better situation behind the scenes. And that was very difficult. From the fans' point of view, Gary, I know you were quite young back then, but like, would you have been aware of this as much? And you kind of felt this was something that was holding us back from taking it to the next level? Yeah, it was kind of, I mean, I like to go back to that Switzerland game and maybe like to find out from Moan because... I, after we'd beaten Switzerland, we'd already beaten the USSR at home. We'd got a good point away to Turkey. And even the way the fixtures were organised, a week later, we had to play the Soviets in Moscow. And then something like three or four days later, go to Bern to face the Swiss. And I know we only even got a goal back. and we, we only lost 2-1 in Moscow. But if anything, that was kind of a free game. But it didn't make sense, certainly from a fixtures point of view, which the FEI would have had an input into to agree to play in that order and to have to go to Bern having made the long trip to Moscow. And I'm just wondering, did that impact on the the player zone or did, can you remember what the travel oh, arrangements I, like? I, I say definitely it would have. I mean, I, you know, I can remember actually whether it was from that particular trip that we, we had to go on a train. And I'm not so sure if it was that one, but certainly there was another trip when John was manager. Uh, we did, we went on the train and we're all in the baggage compartment of the train coming from Moscow uh, uh, to I don't think it was Bern I don't think it was, it was some I think it might have been going to uh, to Berlin or somewhere like that was still a hell of a long trip but I mean the travel arrangements like I say were shocking like they really were so I mean you'd be absolutely tra traveling the next day after playing uh, Russia or USSR uh, traveling the next day. So then you just you arrive there one day and then you play the next day. You know, it was crazy type of thing. Um, and it was that way. I mean, it's it really, as you can say, that that continued on for a long time. I mean, you know, during my time, basically, I could say that I only had the squad all together for one day before big games, before big games. You know, simply because, OK, they played on a Saturday, mainly in England. So they traveled on the Sunday so we could start Monday. Liam Brady, who was one of the big players for me, he played on a Sunday. So he traveled on the Monday. So you didn't have your squad together until the Tuesday and you played on the Wednesday. And that you, you, could, you could do very little preparation, proper preparation. I mean, I always said that, you know, it's a, if we could only qualify, then we'd have three weeks together because you'd have a training camp. And that would be the first time ever that apart from... You know, when we did, say, go on this, some of these silly trips to Poland, because we seem to be always playing Poland, uh, that you'd be together as a squad. You know, so um, 
you know, a squad like relaxed and in a proper training environment, not a squad that's jumping on blooming trains and planes and coaches and whatever. Uh, so, I mean, again, I can't emphasize how unprofessional it was at that time for professionals. That's, that was the contradiction. Here's all the players playing with top clubs in England, a lot of them, being treated like, you know, the way you should be treated, staying in travel arrangements over in England or wherever they would be going would be top class, accommodation would be top class. Then you're playing for your country. And it's, it's quite the opposite. Now, that shouldn't be. I mean, it's, it's kind of insulting, if you like. Not that the players moaned around like that because they knew that's the way it was. But it was just something that had to be addressed. I tried, I tried, I mean, I did address it after our, our disastrous South American tour where we got thrashed 7 0 by Brazil. Uh, I mean, that, oh my God, you know, jeepers, that, that actually brought it all home. This, is, this can't go on like this. So, anyway, there we go. Yeah, fair well for us, certainly come a long way since then. And to touch on it, if we did have a lot of top players playing for top clubs back then, Dave, or Dean Braves with Arsenal, Steve Highway was with Liverpool, Paddy Mulligan was with Chelsea. Joe Kinnear is with Tottenham. Like these were some of the top teams in England. So after your 80 qualifying one, which we finished third, John Giles resigned. And initially, Alan Kelly took over as manager and you were assistant. We played Switzerland, won 2 0. And Alan Kelly remains the only Ireland manager to have a 100% record because he was with Preston at the time as well. And he decided to stick out there because I suppose also the fact that he had a business in Preston also run out. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, I mean, actually, I've used that as a trivia question and people never got it, like, I mean, about who's the most successful manager Ireland ever had. And it's Alan Kelly, he played 1-1-1. One, one, one. Uh, but you're right, I mean, Alan, when he took over after John Giles, because he was helping John, he was assistant to John, and John resigned, and then Alan was, he became the manager. But then Alan then contacted me, and I played with Alan, and I got on very well with him, and I was, of course, manager of Limerick, and uh, we had had a very successful season. So he asked me, would I be his assistant this side of the water? And that makes sense. You know, he'd be in England, I'd be in Ireland. So uh, he asked me. And then, as you said, like, I mean, he was he had a sports shop in Preston and he was manager of Preston. And uh, the pressure was, was put on him and says, you can't do everything. You can't do this. And so he resigned after the one game. And so that left me in charge for a game that was coming up, and what a game it was. It was Argentina in, uh, in Dublin. Maradona's, um, uh, well, certainly debut in Lansdowne, I think. Yeah. Although, so did he play there before? Or something? Or anyway, international debut in Lansdowne against Ireland. And that was, a, that was the series of, uh, I don't know, coincidences that kind of uh, me, manager of Limerick, okay, being successful there, won the league, and then Alan asked me to the assistant. Uh, John hadn't resigned. Alan resigning. And then me. Then a series of interviews and all that. And then I was appointed. And you're certainly thrown straight into the deep end for what would have been classed as the group of death qualifying for the World Cup in 82 in Spain. France, the previous finalists of the World Cup in Netherlands and Belgium. An extraordinary campaign. You know, we were really, really strong at Lansdowne beating France and the Dutch, and draw on with Belgium. But it was our way for them that cost us once again, uh, only taking one point for them three away games. But you can't mention this campaign and that night in Brussels. Well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I still... I mean, it actually came out afterwards. There was a, it, was a, it was reported in the Telegraph that uh, Nazare was the Portuguese referee. And uh, I remember Mickey Walsh was playing out there saying, this guy's got a reputation for... It. Anyway, cut to the short. I mean, I, I actually accused him I mean, the, the, the decisions were absolutely disgraceful. Uh, you know, we had a perfect goal by Frank Stapleton, Brady Stapleton movement from Arsenal, free kick. And then their goal near the end of the match was given, for, there was a series of fouls that they committed. Uh, the last one being Kuliman's holding down Seamus McDonough as he headed into the net. So the referee, I went to him on the pitch. I was living and I said, you're a cheat. You've taken money. Now, I should have been reported for that. Well, it was subsequently proven that he did. There was, a, there was an involvement there. So we would have won that game, but certainly not have lost it, and that would actually have qualified us. And that, to me, was a huge... I mean, it's sad that I think back on it. Uh, not 
necessarily for myself. It would have been great. Of course it would. But uh, for the players that I had that were in their prime, and some of them never really got the chance, like Liam Brady being a great example, to play at a World Cup finals. And that would have been such a such a lift to the whole country as well, as we know what subsequently happened. Um, but it was all because of that horrible, horrible night that we were never going to win that game. In fact, we were had to lose it. In fact, the irony of that is that Jack Charles was there as a, a UEFA observer. And he came into our dressing room afterwards and he, he actually said he'd never seen refereeing like that. It was blatant robbery. It was an irony to that because it was... You know, if 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 that hadn't happened, uh, Jack wouldn't have been in the job. I don't think when he did come into it. So, just go yeah, back to well, that. Know. Sorry, Gary. Yeah, just uh, another bit on the, on that game because it subsequently came out that Anderlecht, the Belgium's leading club, uh, they were convicted by UEFA a couple of years later of bribing referees. So it actually worked both ways. I know Mickey Walsh had said, and I remember Raoul's and Azare's name as well. It haunted my childhood, but. Um, it subsequently came out as well that Anderlecht, the Belgium's leading club, were, were, were done by UEFA for bribing referees shortly after that. I think, it was actually, I think it was Nottingham Forest, if I remember correctly, also got done by a, a referee in Belgium. And uh, it, it, must, it must really hurt when you see what happened after that. Well, you know, it's a terrible frustration about it. But, I mean, you've just got to... You have to accept it. It's gone. It's finished with. And you think... Oh gosh, it would never have happened today because the scrutiny, you know, the scrutiny that games are under now, from all angles, from referees, from, uh, from, from well, certainly on referees, it just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, and you're right; it was proven that, that there was this scandal in Belgian football or whatever about it, and um, obviously there was talk. I think it was it was reported in the Telegraph, as I say, and I think it was a mafia involvement as well, like to it that. Um, you know, I mean, I had suspicions that that sort of thing would go on. And, you know, there was other horrible decisions that happened with us under John Jods as well. Um, and I actually was very cynical about, you know, a lot of it was down to the way that maybe referees, when they came to Dublin, they weren't maybe treated the way that they might have been in other countries. And you... You heard stories that say a ref would be going to Germany and the, there'd be a kind of a, a little word said, listen, ref, you have a good game. There could be a nice present waiting for you at the airport, you know, and that nice present might be a Mercedes or something like that. You know, in other words, you know, and I, I've no doubt that that stuff did go on, you know, whether it be some sort of a, a but it certainly didn't happen to any refs that came to Ireland. That's for sure. <laughs> I would imagine that. That played a part in, you know, some of the, you know, I suppose, uh, if there's a 50-50 decision and you're not treated properly by the host, well, then you're not going to give the decision their way and all that kind of thing. Human nature comes into it. Uh, you look after the officials and that's the way it is now. And that's the way it should have been. It should be all the time. Not to a point where you kind of say to them, hey, listen, we look after you better if. You know, that's it. You wouldn't get away with that kind of conversation now anyway. Just there was. one one more thing on that yeah, campaign, so because uh, at the end of the campaign, I, I thought it was actually very unfair. I know it doesn't happen anymore, but France were allowed to play their last two games when we were finished. And uh, I know Jack, uh, it all started for Jack Charlton on the Euro 88 campaign, but he did need a slice of luck with Gary McCoy scoring that late goal in Bulgaria. Uh, I know you were faced with the same situation that if France had actually drawn with Holland and Paris, which is not a, an unreasonable result. I mean, Holland had been runners up in the last two World Cup finals. If France had actually drawn with Holland instead of beaten Holland, uh, we would have qualified for uh, for the World Cup in 82. And even then, unfortunately, it was not to be. Well, you know, that actually I went to that game because it meant so much. I persuaded the powers to be that I should be there uh, to see what was going on. And I mean, to be quite honest with you, I was amazed. There was there was talk of all this kind of uh, stuff in the in the Dutch camp. There was arguments and whatever about money and things like that. But they played that night, you know, as if they weren't interested, you know. And that was uh, such a disappointing thing because I mean the, that that uh, um, that. Uh, 
section or what do you call it? Uh, you know, that group, that group. It was a very, you know, as you say, the group of death. But in that being the last game, I couldn't believe the way the Holland went out and played. Last night. You know, very disappointing. Terry Conroy came with me, my assistant. And, uh, you know, it's funny, actually, you alluded there and uh, you alluded to Jack and, and Gary Mackay and all that kind of thing. That's the amazing thing about it. Um, it, it I find my, I, when, when I say this, I hate people to come back and say, oh, it's only sour grapes. It's not. But the irony of it is that Jack was actually being got rid of at the end of his first campaign because of the style of football, because of uh, the long ball game. And people just did not, they weren't happy with it and whatever. And there was this huge kind of thing. Well, okay. And I can remember I was in Saudi Arabia. I was approached by a couple of the FAI and said, would you put your name forward again? Uh, and I said, well, oh, Jack, what do you mean? He said, no, Jack, we're changing Jack. Now, this is before the Bulgaria match with Scotland. Jack was actually not being kept on. And that is a fact. Now, it's a fact that I can't prove. But I only say that to just to, to, to stress there's a very, very thin line of things going your way as against, say, the Nazare thing with the Belgian thing and things. And it's, it's as if, like, if it's not to be, it's not to be. I mean, Jack, I don't think, was even, wasn't even watching that Scotland-Bulgaria uh, match. And that was unheard of, Bulgaria to lose in Sofia. You know, absolutely. They hadn't lost there in years. So, quite amazingly, then all of a sudden, we're qualified. And I was, I mean, I was absolutely delighted. I really was. Because, I, oh, by the way, I'd said, no, 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 I've done my stint. I've done my five years. I've not put my name forward for, for, for the position again. Um, I was in Saudi Arabia and I was on a contract out there anyway. But uh, it is amazing the way that, you know, I was delighted, by the way, for the players, you know, for the lads that I knew and I brought into the scene, all the guys I gave their debut to, the Mick McCarthy's and all these guys, Cascarino, although he denies that I gave him his debut publicly, <laughs> he says that Jack got in touch with him. <laughs> anyway, I find that strange. I find that strange. But, you know, I also understand that it's kind of sexier to talk about Jack than it is about anything before him. Anyway, there we go. That's the cynicism coming out of me now. It's just goes to show and still is on um, back in those days, like how simple the moments can change games. And so it is good as well in terms of qualifying campaigns that all games are now played at the same time on the final day. There was some memorable days and great days in that qualifying campaign, Gary. And like it's no real surprise when you look back at a couple of the regulars from that team, Chris Newton, Kevin Moore, Frank Stapleton, Ronnie Whelan, and David O'Leary. They all went on to play in major tournaments for Ireland. So the Macons was always there that we had a team that could get that far. Yeah, there were some great players as well, though, that never got to major tournaments, like Mark Lawrence Sorry, was there as well, Michael that? Robinson. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Owen? Oh, listen, that was a great squad. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I, was, I had a great squad of players under me as well, and they were all great. I mean, some of the stuff that was you know, thrown at the, you know, the English the English born lads you know some say if a result didn't go well and now some of the nonsense that they're not trying a leg by people who hadn't got a clue about football every one of those lads but they were absolutely committed and you know just recently there we lost poor michael robinson you know fellas like that like a tony Grealish, another one gone uh, you know two two great lads and what commitment they gave you hey gosh i mean you couldn't get better you know absolutely um so there was never, I mean, I hated, I, I was absolutely disgusted when people say, oh, they're not trying a leg. Not a chance, no way, not a chance. But anyway, that's why it was great, I can say, when when, I, when we did qualify for, for them. And of course, went on to do the Stuttgart business, which is the big thing, beating England. <laughs> anyway. And of course, Gary, there were some great players on the team that never got to play the major tournament, so like some Mark Lawrence and Aline Brady. Me. And I have to say, Mark Lawrenson is up there. He has to be. Mark was such a great, versatile player. He could play anywhere and he'd have a good game. You know, you could play him centre-back, you could play him full-back, left-right-back, you could play him midfield, you could play him up front. And you actually, if you said to Mark, Mark, Mark I'm going to stick you in goal, Mark would just go, OK. And I guarantee you, I don't think he'd let you down. 
I never had to do that, but but that's the type of lad he was. He was a great athlete, but a fabulous footballer. You know, in such a, a great manner. Like he was always cool. He was never under pressure. Like I mean, he was he he was so efficient on the football field. I can never remember him having a poor game. You know, he's he's that type of player. Uh, Liam, of course, was very very inventive, creative player. You know, such a, a, a genius with the left foot. But uh, Mark, and of course, then I, you know, the other players I had, I mean, there was John Devine, who's actually trying to get hold of me, Dave Langan, Kevin Morden, the O'Leary brothers, Stapo, Michael Robinson, Mickey Walsh, Tony Galvin, uh, all these lads, Ronnie Whelan, Mick McCarthy, then bringing him in, in, into it at a later stage. Anyway, it's funny when you, you, you look back on it, it uh, doesn't seem that long ago. Because you still managed Limerick, who you had great success with in the early 80s, and then you had a spell over St. Pat's in the middle of your turn as Ireland manager. Well, yeah, I mean, I had actually, I had gone, I'd resigned from Limerick. Um, Pat Grace had come into the, the reckoning, and uh, he, I don't know, I had a bit of a row with Pat Grace, and uh, I resigned um, because he was he was not uh, helpful towards the Ireland job, and uh, so I resigned from that, and I opened a sports shop with Tony Ward in Dublin. And that's why I was, you know, Pat asked me then would I manage them. And basically, I said, I will, for, we'll see how it goes. About that the challenge, about keeping the, the uh, first division, uh, the old first division. And I did. And... But that's how it came about, that I'd resigned from them and I'd opened a board shop. Yeah, so. I enjoyed my time at St. Pat's. I mean, it was a, a lovely club, lovely atmosphere around the place. And again, like, supporters are great there. Certainly are. Um, Gary, I touched on there. He was Limerick manager before Ireland, so obviously Owen must bring back some great, great times for yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, Owen is still a legend in Limerick. I mean, he's the last man to win the league with Limerick, the last man to win the FAI Cup with Limerick. I should also point out, Owen was playing for Limerick as well. He was player manager, not just managing Limerick and also managing the national team. Talk about double or treble jobbing. But I suppose, as as he said, it's, it's it was totally different times. Um, it's amazing he found the time to do everything that he had to do. Um, but he will always be fondly, so fondly remembered in Limerick. They were just fantastic days and certainly the best memories of, of my time following the club by, by a country mile. My time with Limerick, sorry, my time with Limerick was, I mean, I always acknowledge it. It's because of the Limerick commitment that they gave me and everybody that I got the Ireland job uh, and also the facilitating me doing it. As you say, player manager, uh, Gary, and uh, it was... I mean, one of the reasons I actually retired from playing was that I could not keep the level of fitness that I that was necessary. Um, so I think I finished playing when I was about 34, 30, 34, or something like that, yeah. Because it, it has happened, um, you know, I mean, I just couldn't. I was afraid that I was going to hurt somebody or get hurt or whatever, you know. So uh, once I couldn't do that, well, then fine. It was time to pack in the playing side of it and concentrate on the coaching and, man and management. The legs have given up. Your last two campaigns as manager, qualifying for Euro 84 and the World Cup in 86, didn't quite reach the heights of that Spain 82 qualifying campaign, but still some great memories. Drawn with the Dutch no, at home, I mean, beat Malta 8 near the home. And then a couple of good home wins as well towards the end against the USSR again and Switzerland. Yeah, we never had the, I suppose, we didn't have the consistency uh, that we, we didn't get the follow on from that 82 campaign. I mean, the disappointment of that, uh, when we really should, we know that we should have qualified. We know we did qualify, except for a dodgy ref. But uh, I don't know, looking back at it, do I... I would think that there had to be some sort of a spin-off on that. I don't know. But, um, you know, sort of a... And then following up, by the way, the disastrous South American tour after that 82 campaign, which was absolutely shocking. It really was. That was so hell. And really, a lot of the lads that went on that trip, I'm sure they were affected when we went out in campaigns. But the one big thing that I look back on for the next two campaigns 
was lack of depth of really good players that we did have. Uh, you know, if we lost Stapleton, Stapleton, well, we didn't have that type of player to play. We might have a different centre forward, but we didn't have the top class player. If we lost Liam, if we lost uh, the you know the centre Kevin Morrison, and there were games, important games that I think that's what actually happened to us. We just did not. Um, we weren't able to to put out our best eleven. At, at any given time. Now, I can only assume that that's the reason why, because I was sure that we were going to continue on and qualify as we deserved to and as the lads that I had deserved to. Um, and that's why I was delighted that we, we eventually did under a different manager. But, uh, you know, there's an irony to it all as well. You know, it's a... And you accept it. Looking back, you say, look, it wasn't to be, and that's it. You just get on with it. There's no point in complaining or moaning about it or whatever, moping about it. And you look back at all the good times, and I, I certainly Limerick there, when Gary alludes to Limerick, I have nothing but memories, great memories. And then, by the way, we're still all great friends there. We, we, we get together twice a year, um, you know, when we play golf and we have a Christmas drink together, all the lads from that era, which is lovely because that's the, the spirit that we engendered. And I still get, I still get an awful lot of, uh, I, I've recently only got a couple of letters from Limerick supporters from that time. Um, you know, various things, wanting whatever, just uh, something signed or whatever there. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, you look back and you say, you say, well, look, uh, you did your best. And that's, I could not, I don't think that I could say, oh, if I had my time over, would I have done it different? Of course, there is detail you would have done different. Of course there is. But overall, no, I wouldn't have. I couldn't have and I wouldn't have. I gave it everything I had, uh, which is, I don't think that I could absolutely feel any any kind of, uh, not, uh, but. I'm, I'm just, I'm sh absolutely sure of that. I committed myself to the actually detriment of my, my family, because you can imagine family life, uh, you know, as Gary just alluded to, uh, it was affected a lot because I was away so much. Um, you know, I had two boys, uh, Gary and Warren, and um, they've gone on to achieve good things. That's good. Uh, they got good educations, um, you know, part of it being a Limerick. Um, so, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I look back and I say, I've been doing stuff all my life that I've loved. Uh, and I'm very, very happy about that. You know, the, the fact that there's not many people can say that. You know, I love football. I got paid for playing it. I went into the management side of it. I travelled. I saw the world. Um I met an awful lot of people all over the place in every continent. Uh, so it's given me a huge, huge kind of uh, vista of experience, if you like, of uh, meeting all the various different types of nationalities and the different, all going to all the different climates and, you know, playing in freezing cold weather, snow and playing boiling hot. And going through all of these experiences, as trying as some of them were, but they were still what experiences they were. Once you love what you're doing in life, you really are winning in life. Gary, or just to kind of finish up small bit here, just have, as I touched on there, there was quite a number of players that played in that 82 campaign. They were a key part of Jack's tenure. You know, over the course of the remaining final years under Owen, he brought you more players like Tony Galvin, Paul McGrath, Mick McCarthy, Kevin Sheedy. It really was only going to be a matter of time before we finally got that breakthrough. Yeah, and I, I think, Owen, as he said, well, whatever you say, desperately unlucky or whatever you say about that referee, maybe unlucky is the wrong thing. But, yeah, it's, there were a lot of quality players around then. Uh, Owen was certainly unlucky. Um, Jack, we got a lucky break with Gary McCoy. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it is, it, it was a great, it was a great squad. And, uh it was great times uh, for for Irish football when we eventually did get to qualify. I think Owen has to get a lot of the credit for doing the groundwork, and 
I just want to go back to one thing too on the the eighty six campaign because we it was another great start. We beat the Soviets in Lansdowne Road in a, a day I can remember fondly. Uh, Mickey Walsh with the goal, and it looked like we were really being set up for that group as well. And I think that we went to Nor we lost like, in the next two games away. We went to Norway first and lost. And if I remember rightly, I think we had injury worries around. It was Liam Brady out for a while and, and Frank Stapleton? I'm just wondering, Owen, would you have done anything differently for the Norway game looking back now? Or I, well, I know. I remember I, I played. Uh, but did you say Frank Stapleton and Liam Brady? Were, were we missing them? I, I, I know we were missing key players, but yeah. I remember I had. To, I, I think I played Frank. But he hadn't been fit. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, they weren't fit. Yeah, he hadn't played any games. Uh, I took a chance and played him, and of course it was a. It, it was. It was, and I had no other option really, than to play Frank because I thought that's right. Now, I remember thinking, I actually do remember thinking that Frank Stapleton's name, his presence on the pitch, would give us an advantage. That maybe his fitness won't won't contribute to, and that's the way it worked out. He wasn't fit to play, but I still played him because I didn't have any option really, okay. and I thought I'd get more out of the fact that he would uh, have that respectability on the pitch. But looking back on it, it was the wrong thing to do. There's no, you know, I mean, you do these things, and at the time you think they're the best thing to do, uh, but obviously, you know, uh, with hindsight, you say no, I could have done it a different way. You know, and I, I should have done it a different way. So, yeah, and I mean, the, the Norway game in Dublin, I mean, that was awful. The, the dour game. That was a dour game, nil nil. And Liam, Liam, I think that was Liam's poorest performance for Ireland. And, uh, you know, I think I did I substitute Liam in that game. I think I did, uh, which was kind of a, you know, it was a well, it was not in outrageous, but uh, it was very unusual for Liam to be substituted. But he, he admitted himself he was having a nightmare. He was just, he just, it's one of those games that it just right from. Yeah, a lot of the seeds for the plant were certainly yeah. sown for your age, age during your time there, Owen. Some great, great memories. Chick at home, we really did seem to make lands down road of fortress, and very rarely did any of the top teams come away with a positive result from there. That's, I suppose, where we're going to come to a wrap on our first of our series looking back at different Ireland managers. I'd like to thank very much Owen for taking time out and joining us today and hopefully we'll hear from you again in the near future on the channel and hopefully you'll keep uh, safe in these uh, changing time zones. Uh, bye bye. As we touched on there, there were some great days in his time, especially in the Lansdowne Road when we really made a fortress and a hard place for a lot of the top nations to get a positive result. And we'd like to thank Owen for his time and joining us on the channel today and hopefully we might get to hear or see him again in the near future and hopefully he's keeping well in these uncertain times. Uh, Gary, that was a really nice way to kick off the, this, this new series of ours and looking back at some really good results that we did have before Jack Charlton got us performance. Yeah, so they, they, we had some great days, uh, as you allude to, Ger, uh, particularly at, at, at home. Um, some great wins I can remember back under, under John Giles and on their own. Uh, a couple of great wins over France, a uh, couple of great wins over the Soviet Union, um, brilliant win over Holland in 1980. They'd been to the previous two, been to two World Cup finals and, and lost the finals. And we finished ahead of them in that group as well. Uh, yeah, it's a, a good win over Switzerland that you mentioned that we had 3-0 hammering, which I fond memories. Of. It was a very cold June day from what I can remember. But anyway, uh they were some good days, unfortunately, some some not so good days away from home. You just wonder if the the travel arrangements and everything had been a bit better. And I'm sure Owen is going to always curse Raul Nazare because he haunted my childhood. I'm sure he haunts Owen a lot more than he haunts me. Yeah, definitely he was the one that got away qualifying for URH2 in Spain. And one of them dark days we didn't touch on, I don't think I really wants to touch on at all, was when we actually lost to England in a competitive game for your oration. We lost 2-0, Kevin Keegan getting both goals for the old enemy there. That's all myself and Gary have time for. And, uh, if you haven't given us a follow on Twitter, you can do so at IrishFanTV. If you haven't already subscribed to us on YouTube, please do. You can check out some of our brilliant content and videos. Sorry, follow some brilliant interviews there with Jerry Armstrong, Richie Towell and Jason Malumbe. Big thanks as well to 
Daniel Kennedy and Aaron Howey for the graphics. They're doing a fantastic job there behind the scenes. That's all from us now on Irish Football Fan TV. I'll be back to you again in the near future.